morning, Covenant College. Good morning, Covenant College. Thank you. Happy Reformation Day to you. And happy All Hallows' Eve. <laughs> a fitting day, of course, to uh, engage in another discussion of some dangerous ideas. That's better. Uh, this morning, Dr. Rebecca Pennington will be our speaker. Dr. Pennington teaches in our education department as a specialist. Okay. Oh, sorry. Dr. Pennington teaches in our education department as a specialist in early childhood education. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree and master's degree at Covenant College and a doctoral degree at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Uh, before coming to teach at Covenant, Dr. Pennington had a great deal of experience as a classroom teacher in Florida, and she and her husband Tucker have two daughters, both of whom are Covenant College graduates. <laughs> Becky is a terrific uh, colleague and a good friend who cares more deeply about what we are doing here at Covenant than almost anyone I know. Uh, perhaps most of you know this or have discovered this as students, but we professors are not required to take classes where we learn how to teach. And some of you are thinking, oh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> it shows. Most of what, uh, most of, uh, what most of us know about teaching, we learn from watching other teachers, for good or ill. Uh, as you can imagine, someone who has devoted a professional life to thinking about teaching and learning may have a thing or two to teach the rest of us about our work in the classroom. And she does, and she has. Uh, Dr. Pennington challenges us regularly to think more carefully about our craft, and along the way she has helped many of us to become better teachers. Uh, so whatever good there is there, she uh, is, is helping us along the way. Uh, she's a great thinker, a beloved professor, a valued colleague, and she is filled with dangerous ideas. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming her this morning as she shares one of them with us. Covenant College. <laughs> so I'm supposed to talk about dangerous ideas. Well, the first very dangerous idea, Dr. Kapik invited an elementary school teacher to speak in chapel on Halloween. <laughs> A shout out to my elementary ed majors down here. <laughs> Now, there isn't much, with the possible exception of how long the spelling list should be, that sparks an argument between Christian school parents better than the question of whether or not kids should celebrate Halloween. No one wants to celebrate evil or the devil's holiday, but we all love to dress up. As a child, I wasn't taken out trick-or-treating. Well, maybe once to the neighbors, and I dressed up as an old lady. <laughs> There's the question of costumes. Is it okay to dress as a witch? Can we dress as storybook characters, or even famous characters from the Bible? Well, no ghosts, ghouls, or goblins for us. Then there's the whole trick-or-treat thing. Excuse me, trunk or treat. After which, children's costume consume buckets of candy. Believe me, the morning after Halloween is one of the craziest times in a classroom. Halloween is big business, second only to Christmas in terms of revenue raked in by retail stores. But many parents substitute Reformation Day for Halloween festivities. And in fact, Reformation Day did not happen by accident. Martin Luther chose All Hallows' Eve, which became Halloween, to air his grievances against the Catholic Church. Now, October 31st is known as Reformation Day. <laughs> and this is the day that Martin Luther 
nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg, starting what became known as the Protestant Reformation. It's a fascinating story and one that leads me to my real dangerous idea for today. That idea? God's the boss. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. It was dangerous for Martin Luther, and it is still dangerous to proclaim this idea today. Martin Luther protested the authority of the Catholic Church at the time, and particularly the egregious practice of selling indulgences. Like the argument over Halloween, this debate pitted two sources of authority against each other. Who rules? Whose authority commands our obedience and our allegiance? In the case of Halloween, sincere Christian parents don't wish to participate in a celebration of evil. In Martin Luther's case, God in Christ was the ultimate authority, not the Catholic Church. Salvation couldn't be bought and sold, but was offered as a free gift of grace through Jesus Christ. The hymn that we just sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, chronicles a clash of powers, conflict between God and the devil, with Christ as the clear victor and our fortress or protection from Satan's power. Let's listen to the words of the third verse again. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us, the prince of darkness grim. We tremble not for him. One little word shall fell him. Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, those words conjure up images of little demons darting in and out of corners, always tripping us up and leading us into temptation. The more I contemplated what dangerous idea I might speak about, the more those little devils popped out like Halloween ghosts at someone's front door. The world, Luther's and ours, is filled with some mighty devils. War, poverty, slavery, racism, hunger, ignorance, corrupt politicians, sex trafficking. I am concerned about those things and hope to work for social justice in some way. But I realize that for me, perhaps for most of us, there are some subtler goblins lurking around that might even be more dangerous. It takes a dangerous idea to banish them. I began to ask myself, what devils fill our world threatening to undo us? What things claim our allegiance and attention, both individually and as a society? To what do we appeal for authority? Sometimes when kids get into arguments on the playground, you'll hear one say, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. But who really is the boss? It seems that there are several candidates for that role in our lives, tempting or threatening, staking a claim on our obedience and beckoning us to bow down. The first of the demons that claims authority <laughs> is sometimes called science, naturalism, The cold, hard voice of reason and its contemporary cousin, Big Data, offers truth and an answer to the problems that plague our world. Data-driven, research-based, and evidence-based best practices claim to be an antidote for what is wrong with the world, ignorance. Since the Enlightenment, when intelligent humans threw off the medieval grip of the church, the Western world has looked to empirical evidence to promote progress and guide the evolution of society into a more just, verdant, and peaceful world, as the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation puts it. Now, don't get me wrong. I appreciate scientific investigation and the knowledge it provides, 
and I certainly wouldn't relish the thought of being labeled anti-intellectual. From advances in medicine, medicine to intricate algorithms that steer city traffic patterns, we benefit from the valuable insights of science and technology. Feats of engineering and architecture inspire awe. We thank God for his revelation in creation that provides good gifts for human enterprise in this way. Yet, as a savior, science fails. In my field of education, trust and evidence is best exemplified in the high stake testing phenomenon. The reasoning goes something like this. What's wrong with the world is that people are ignorant. They do evil things because they don't know any better. If we can educate everyone using data and experimental research results, we can build a better world. For example, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan, have created the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which has allocated $3 billion to the goal of curing all disease in their child's lifetime. According to NPR, funding will support basic research for such projects as creating an atlas of all the cells in the human body. It may be argued that education reformers and philanthropists have poorly placed motives and that their faith in human progress is, and not in God is simply benign. Not so with the new atheists. For some of them, indoctrination of children with sinister stories of bloody sacrifice that atones for perceived sins is patently false and damaging to children, virtual child abuse. Bill Nye the Science Guy, loved and trusted by many children, is an ardent critic of Christian beliefs, calling for just the facts, often in condescending tones. Clearly, no reasonable person can cling to such fairy stories as those told by religious folk. Ecclesiastes 12.12 12 warns us, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For those in the academy in medicine and education, it may be dangerous to openly proclaim Jesus is Lord. This question is complicated, and we can debate how Christians might grapple with this tension. In fact, many have written on this topic. But in the end, we still ask, is human reason the boss? Does God's truth abide still? It's dangerous to proclaim that God's the boss. A second wily devil, working to undo us, is work, or rather, an inordinate worship of work. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was commanded to work, and it was good. But after Adam and Eve disobeyed God, their work was cursed, painful and difficult. God's good intention for humans to work as the caretakers of creation became distorted and fulfillment in their labor fleeting. Today, we see worship of wealth, status, and efficiency as evidence that our creation mandate messed up. Instead of stewarding God's good gifts, our accomplishments become a source of identity and significance, a theme often repeated here at Covenant. Inevitably, our calendar rules us, and efficiency becomes our highest good. In my case, I find myself task-oriented, continually believing that I would just get a little more organized or learn to use one more technological tool. I will be able to truly find peace and earn status as a smart and effective professor. I'll get more work published. I'll be able to handle all of the grading, committee work, core revision in the world without pricking a sweat I'll be a perfect wife, mother, caring friend, if I just work smarter, not harder. In a similar vein, we believe that hard work will lead to more money, and the market becomes the arbiter of truth. In essence, 
who's the boss will be answered by that old adage, he who dies with the most toys wins. Will it sell? We've only to look at the current presidential campaign to see examples of this. Moral authority becomes invested in the one who can outsmart the law to get rich, even if it means abusing people along the way. Again, tools for efficient work and faithful stewardship are part of God's provision for us as we live together. But the temptation to trust them as a means of redemption is strong. A Google search for work-life balance yielded 75,600,000 hits. The study of vocation and the role of spiritual formation in pursuing our calling are hot topics right now. Exhausted and overwhelmed, many of us feel bewitched by the promise a career path holds out. Yet we know instinctively this is a path to destruction, a golden calf soon to be toppled if God isn't the boss. It can seem foolish to make work-related decisions based on a commitment to the worship of God first, a promotion lost from weekends spent with family, not on the golf course, scorn from colleagues flummoxed by following a spouse's call to serve in ministry and the pay cut that that accompanies it. Yes, it's a dangerous idea to act as if God's truth abideth still, to act like God really is the boss, even over our careers. A third ghoul, gambling about. <laughs> is entertainment. Entertainment is king, and the rich and famous reign as priests and princes. Television, YouTube, video games, social media, all of it sucks us in. The hours we spend in unwitting homage serve as ample evidence of its sovereignty. In my world, the worst sin a teacher can commit is to be boring. Our mantra repeats itself. <laughs> in presentation after presentation. Learning should be fun. Personalized learning delivered by that high priestess, Google Chrome, promises fun, fame, and fortune all at once. Computer solutions disrupt the status quo and innovation rocks our world. More seriously, gaming, pornography, addictions destroy lives at an increasing pace. In my own life, the guilty pleasure of madman binges on Netflix illustrate entertainment's allure. For a few sweet minutes of escape, I can fancy myself flirting with Don Draper <laughs> or writing copy as Peggy Olson. Discontent with our present reality, we seek what sociologists call simulacra, the artificial replacement of the real in a relentless search for meaning. Certainly, a rich imagination ignites our interactions with, the, uh, with each other in God's world, but the titillating treasures of the virtual world can distract us from more virtuous pursuits, like reading for class and studying for test meeting. <laughs> so what's wrong with that? Everyone needs a break now and then. And besides, truth emerges as the characters' vices earn them their deserved due. I love cotton candy chick flicks. And one of my favorite is 27 Dresses. With Katherine Heigl as Jane, the plain friend who is always the bridesmaid, never the bride. I love the scene in, with the crazy cab ride where she changes her outfit 10 times while jugg jiggling, juggling two gigs of, as a maid of honor at the same time. But then the horror one feels at her sister's rehearsal dinner, watching as her jealous rehearsal video rips her sister's Tessa's wedding plans to shreds. It's instructive, a warning not to allow the green-eyed monster to eat out one's heart. 
But the film's overall message, like that of many, is you need to be concerned for you. You need to be true to yourself. Stop doing things for others and pay attention to your own wants and your own needs some of the time. The arts, including film and other media artifacts, are not evil in and of themselves, and perhaps my characterizing them as bedevilers isn't fair. But an honest appraisal of the role of entertainment in American life suggests caution is in order. It takes bravery to ask, is God the boss of my fun? Does time wasted on banality threaten to undo me? Sometimes I fear it does. It's a dangerous idea. God's the boss, and I am not. The final demon of the day is arguably the biggest one, and it's simply me, myself, and I. You may remember the chocolate cake story from Convocation. I am a pretty princess who wants my way and wants to rule as queen for a day, every day. God is not on the throne of my life all the time. In fact, sometimes I live as a virtual atheist, ignoring his word, rejecting his grace, proclaiming myself the ruler of my life. While reading the history of the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, I was struck by Luther's devotion to God and commitment to do his will. According to the hymnology, Luther, nearly struck by lightning in the frightening thunderstorm, promised to become a monk, which he did. As the story goes, he underwent various types of self-denial and self-flagellation in order to put to death his selfish, sinful nature. Such notions have never occurred to me. I hate pain. Yet all of that did not comfort Luther's haunted soul. Only he slowly came to, only as he slowly came to grasp God's grace in Jesus, did the chains of his fear and doubt fall off, and we now remember him for his message that the just shall live by faith. Martin Luther sparked the Protestant Reformation. His dangerous idea that God's truth abideth still truly changed the Western world. Now, well, gotta take that one off. My costumes, like Jane's bridesmaid's outfits in 27 dresses, they seem silly and signal a lack of serious attention to God's sovereignty. But, like the parade of costume bridesmaids at Jane's real wedding at the end of the movie, I hope they point to a larger reality, the reign of God in our lives and in Christ's rule. In the eloquent words of Abraham Kuyper, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. When God sees me, he doesn't see the wicked witch. He sees the shimmering righteous robes of Jesus. Let's listen to Luther's words in the final verse of that powerful hymn. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours, through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. May we, like Luther, live out the dangerous idea that God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. God's the boss. Please stand. Praise God from.